rising like mist from the grave, gliding noiselessly through solid walls and doors. Ghosts have been woven into our consciousness for centuries. Tales of the disembodied spirits of the dead appear in folklore around the world, and ghost stories have made their audiences shiver from earliest times. We don't know what happens to us after death, but most of us like to think that some essential element of our personality persists. Some would even believe we are transmuted to spirit form. And from this arises the unsettling possibility that in some cases, the process can go wrong. There are as many sorts of ghosts as there are human societies. But there are also striking similarities between ghosts in different countries and centuries. Sometimes the ghosts are of well-known people and are instantly recognizable. The ghost of Abraham Lincoln is often seen at the White House. The many deaths in the American Civil War deeply troubled Lincoln. Perhaps this is what prevents him from resting eternally in peace. Unlike Lincoln, other ghosts may be anonymous. One of the more common motifs is the white lady, often clad in flowing white robes. In Russia, Rusalka is the ethereal ghost of a drowned woman, seen haunting rivers and lakes. There are various explanations for her presence. A desperate love affair, a tragic accident, murder, but all involve powerful emotions and deep passions that have caused her soul to be trapped forever at the scene of her death. The Rusalka is not frightening, although her appearance may cause alarm. She has even been said to help lost travelers and fishermen in difficulties. Although some ghosts are comforting or consoling, most are quite literally chilling experiences. The air temperature plummets when a ghost appears. Witnesses have a variety of reactions. Terror is a common one, as is shortness of breath. And many experience the classic sensation of hair standing on end. The ghosts themselves come in many shapes and styles. They have been ethereal or solid, grotesque or beautiful, talkative or silent. They can be men, women, or children, animals, vehicles, or even entire buildings. Whatever form ghosts take, the living recognize that they are in the company of something unreal, something which defies natural laws and challenges the safety of their known world. But our fear of the unknown competes with our fascination, and our deeply felt interest in ghosts has hardly diminished over time sample of society in any century, someone is more than likely to have seen a ghost. There is no shred of scientific evidence to support the existence of ghosts, and no single ghost sighting has ever been objectively proved. Yet ghost encounters are, and always have been, one of the most common supernatural experiences. Since earliest times, sincere personal accounts describe an unshakable conviction among thousands of individuals that they have indeed seen a ghost. In the words of Samuel Johnson, written more than 200 years ago, all argument is against it, but all belief is for it. Middle Ages, ghosts were known to engage in battles with the living and even appear as entire hordes. Few things could be more unnerving than the unstoppable band of thundering ghostly horsemen which swept across northern Europe as the wild hunt. Led originally by incarnations of Norse gods, the wild huntsmen terrified those who saw or heard them. 
The Wild Hunt is an ancient um, Scandinavian legend which uh, has been commonly believed in uh, a large area of northern Europe. And the story is that the Wild Hunt derives from the belief that the god Wotan occasionally paid visits um, to the earth, accompanied by a retinue of huntsmen, horses and um, baying hounds. And his object in visiting the earth was to um, abduct souls and take them back to um, Valhalla. Sightings of the Wild Hunt declined during later centuries as Christianity spread across Europe. But the horsemen still make an occasional appearance, leaving in their trail scenes of waste and devastation. It is said that if a person is unfortunate enough to hear the sound of the wild hunt, and above all to see the awful sight, that he or she will not live very long to survive and tell the uh, tale. Riders of the Wild Hunt are vivid evidence that it is not only humans that can take ghostly form. Legends of phantom coaches and, of course, horses and mysterious riders are part of folklore everywhere. So I suppose that's sort of kind of extension from ghosts. After all, we talk about ghosts and forget that, in fact, ghosts are wearing clothes. Their clothing has obviously been somehow made ghost-like with them. And if they were riding a horse, then that horse becomes part of the ghost. The chilling image of the headless horseman in the twilight is familiar across Europe and North America. Deeply embedded in tales of murder and revenge, these figures typify the ghost condemned to repeat eternally the journey of its villainous life. They are a potent symbol of the restless ghost, unable to find peace in the grave. Many ghost stories involve other things other than people. For instance, ghost ships. Ghost ships are a very long-standing tradition. There is, of course, the legend of the Flying Dutchman, but that's far from being the only one. There are many different versions of the Flying Dutchman story. One takes place in the early 1800s, when a ship sailing around the Cape of Good Hope met with bad weather. The crew begged their captain to head for shelter. This he refused to do, and challenged God to sink his ship. At this, an apparition appeared on the deck, and the captain, before his terrified crew, ordered it to leave and threatened to shoot it. His pistol exploded in his hand. The apparition then pronounced its curse, which was for the captain to sail forever without rest, a source of ill luck to anyone who sighted the doomed ship on its ceaseless voyage. exist in all societies around the world since the beginning of the recording of human history. Um, beliefs about ghosts around the world are surprisingly similar in many ways. The dead are meant to move smoothly from the land of the living to their proper place among the spirits. If this transition goes wrong, the spirit is stranded, neither one thing nor the other. can become a ghost. There aren't any uh, rules that apply that if you do certain things in life, you're going to become a ghost. A ghost is our evidence of survival after death, and a ghost can take many forms. It can appear as an apparition. It can appear as some sort of recording caught in time and space. But ultimately, we believe in ghosts because we really need them. We need them as evidence of the survival of our soul. We also need them uh, to reassure us of um, things in, in our own world. Ghosts come to offer advice, they come to give warnings, they come to console us. They validate a lot of things for us in the world of the living and also reassure us that we will not come to an end once our physical life is over. So I cannot rest, I cannot stay, I cannot linger anywhere.
ghosts, having the benefits of hindsight and experience, may also give guidance to the living. The novelist Charles Dickens had seen ghosts himself, and they played central roles in his fiction. In one of Dickens' most popular works, A Christmas Carol, ghosts teach Scrooge the error of his ways and change his wretched life before it is too late. Scrooge's ghostly visitors are weighed down with chains, burdensome fetters that bind them to our world. But Dickens was not the first to use this motif. The chain-clanking ghost is as old as literature itself. In what is considered the very first recorded ghost story, the Greek Athenodorus describes the sound of rattling chains. Well, Athenodorus is the great classical investigation, probably the first classical investigation that ever took place. It's recorded by Pliny the Younger, the Roman historian, and has come down to us as the first example of a chain-clanking ghost that we know about. Athenodorus's story was a true one, based on his own experiences. The events took place in Greece more than 2,000 years ago, and center on a house known to be haunted by the particularly noisy and troublesome ghost of an old man. Taking advantage of the attractively low rent and unmoved by the dire warnings of previous inhabitants, Athenodorus moved in. Soon he became aware of the nightly chain clanking and even saw the tortured apparition. At first Athenodorus attempted to ignore it, but then, his curiosity aroused, he realized that the ghost was trying to communicate with him. Athenodorus followed the ghost into the night. morning, Athenodorus fetched the local magistrate and led him to examine the spot where the ghost had taken him before it suddenly vanished in the night. Athenodorus was convinced that the ghost had a reason for his haunting. He wondered if the spirit had no proper resting place and decided that there would be no peace in the house until he solved the puzzle of the unhappy apparition. In the night, Athenodorus had marked the spot with a handful of leaves. There, he was sure, lay the solution to the mystery. When they dug at the spot, the remains of a body were found. The bones were reburied with proper ceremony, and the ghost was seen no more. Justice had been done, and the ghost could rest in peace. Not all ghosts are so easily satisfied. Some come for only one thing to deliver a sentence of death. Messengers of death appear in many societies, and their grim warning can never be revoked. The message may come as a glimpse out of the corner of the eye, as the echo of a beautiful song, or an intolerable wail, but its meaning is always instantly clear to the doomed target. One of the most common types of ghosts is the death omen ghost, the ghost who appears to warn of an impending death. The banshee falls into this category, the banshee of Irish and Scottish folklore. Banshees have traditionally been associated with the fairies of the forest, but unlike their sisters, they have a sinister side. Banshees are a Celtic, essentially an Irish um, belief. Um, they are a form of um, crisis apparition insofar as their howling is sometimes said to be heard when a death is about to take place. Uh, comparatively few people have actually uh, seen a banshee, but um, they're said to sometimes appear in different forms, sometimes as um, an old woman, sometimes as a young one, and sometimes as a woman who has been seen on the uh, banks of a river uh, engaged in what washing clothing, which is sometimes said to be the clothing of the person who is about to die. In the year 1318, the Norman knight Richard de Clare met his banshee. On his way to battle in Scotland, he saw a loathsome woman at the river's edge. Richard watched with alarm as she washed out copious quantities of blood and gore. Fascinated with horror by the quantities of blood, he asked the woman whose garments they were. Yours, she replied. Richard 
attempted to dismiss the woman as a lunatic. Yet the next day he lay dead on the battlefield, his clothes soaked and caked with blood. Some old Irish families, such as the O'Briens, O'Malley's, O'Rourke's and O'Donnell's, have their own personal banshees who act almost as guardian spirits to the family. They seem both to lament a death and to celebrate the crossing over of another member of their clan. Even when living individuals emigrate, banshees continue to watch over them. Their deaths have been announced by the familiar whales as far afield as North America and Australia. For centuries, the banshee has meant certain death, normally within days of her appearance. Family members who hear her haunting song know one of them will soon die. But for those who actually see the banshee, they know the death will be theirs. Few ghosts take a more direct hand in the affairs of the living than those who haunt the Japanese. Japanese ghosts can take many forms. They'll usually wear white because white is the colour of death. Ghosts are very closely linked to death, of course, because they haven't died properly. That's why they're ghosts. They'll also look very dishevelled. Their hair will be uh, disarranged. And that's because the reason for being a ghost is that you have some kind of passion which uh, prevents you from really going into the world of the dead or into extinction. And as long as you have that passion, nothing else is on your mind. You don't brush your hair, you don't comb your hair, you don't wash it, you don't, and it uh, becomes uh, a riot of, uh, of hair. Now, ghosts also in Japan tend to be female. And the reason for that is the strong emotion, the emotions of the heart, are traditionally thought to be more matters of uh, women than men, because women, it is thought, have less self-control. In Japan, ghostly activities are taken for granted. They intrude everywhere and can be the cause of much misery. While a rich spiritual past and the fusing of different religions may account for the sheer variety of Japanese ghosts, they do not explain why ghosts intervene so actively in everyday life. Japanese ghosts uh, have some powers that Western ones don't have. For example, Japanese ghosts can kill. In the West, a ghost can inspire somebody else to take revenge for them. Uh, Hamlet's ghost, for example, tries to get the younger Hamlet to murder Claudius. Uh, a Japanese ghost wouldn't need to do that. The Japanese ghost could come back and kill for him or herself. And they can do this by driving the person insane and to suicide. Or they can do it much more easily by um, breathing on them some malevolent spirit and killing them. Not surprisingly, illustrations of ghosts and ghost stories have been a prominent part of Japanese popular culture. Volumes of ghost prints were greeted with pleasure and excitement in the Japanese homes of the 18th and 19th centuries, and demand for ever more grotesque and horrifying images grew on such a scale that the government became concerned and finally passed laws to curb their publication. There's a long tradition of ghost painting in all of East Asia. And one reason for that is that, according to ancient Chinese painting theories, some of which go back to the, to the um, early centuries AD, a good painter can paint human beings, but only a superlative painter can paint the unknown spirits. In Japanese thought, it is the unhappy, uncared for ghost which is most likely to be troublesome to the living. It is worth some effort to follow the rituals which will ensure the spirits safe passage on their journey west to the land of the dead. Candles are widely used during the transition of souls to the afterlife. All over the world, a lit candle is said to repel demons and evil spirits and to protect the soul of the newly dead. All cultures believe that it is proper and wise to treat the dead with respect. 
In 19th century Ireland, this was expressed by visiting and touching the corpse. There were many other rituals surrounding mourning and funerals. The correct laying out of the dead has been a feature of European culture for centuries. If everything is done properly, the living will have done all they can to ensure that the soul will rest. Mirrors, always powerful in mystical thought, have long been considered confusing to a soul weakened by its approach to death. In parts of Europe, all reflective surfaces are covered as a precaution. The unsettled period immediately after death is a dangerous one. Ghosts and evil spirits threaten the deceased and close family. Charms, amulets and religious symbols are all used as protection. The belief in the power of these ancient rituals lives on in many cultures as folklore or local superstition. In the Scottish lowlands, candles are still waved over corpses in a pre-Christian ceremony. No one wants a ghost returning to haunt its old home, and there are rituals to prevent this. The corpse should be taken out of the house feet first, and preferably by the back door. Its progress to the grave must be slow and solemn, and may include stops at places with special meaning for the deceased, to give the spirit the chance to take a final farewell. One of the most widespread burial customs, placing the favorite items of the deceased in the grave, is only partly intended as consolation. Anything which will comfort and help the spirit in the afterlife will encourage it to stay there and not return to haunt the living. The Egyptians, who had a deep fear of ghosts, made the most exhaustive provisions for the soul after death and devoted much energy to devising spells and magical charms which equipped the soul to complete the challenging journey beyond the grave. Sometimes, too, items are placed in the grave to help keep the ghost from escaping. Not only is iron heavy, but according to some traditions, ghosts cannot pass over it. In ancient times, it was believed that if you did not have the proper burial, then uh, your soul would be restless and would come back as a ghost to haunt the living. And um, burial customs differ around the world, but the idea that proper burial is necessary to ensure uh, safety in, in the other world is almost universal. Special care was taken over the burial of those who died tragic or violent deaths, as these were the souls least likely to find rest. Careful consideration was also given to dangerous people, such as criminals and witches. In the past, they were buried at crossroads to confuse the spirits and prevent them from returning home. Suspected vampires were impaled with a stake through the heart to put a stop to their nightly wanderings. The cemetery is a calm and peaceful place and most cultures try to keep it that way. Iron railings ward off evil spirits and hold in ghosts. Trees are also important. In China, cypress trees are said to give strength to the souls of the departed. And in Europe, yew trees are not only symbols of regeneration, but also have invasive roots which are said to secure the dead in their graves. So too do the heavy headstones. Even after the funeral, the danger is not over. Despite the most rigorous precautions, it is still possible for ghosts with a particular problem to try to return to their homes. Mourners may take a different route home from the cemetery in order to try to mislead the spirit. In extreme cases, doors or even whole houses may be repainted to confuse it. Superstitions deal with the discouragement of ghosts. Iron horseshoes on the door help to keep them at bay, as does salt when laid along the threshold. Best of all is a flowing stream which no ghost can cross. 
the traditional wearing of black clothes makes the mourner harder for the searching spirits to locate. For those who have failed to protect themselves from ghosts, the appearance of a representative from beyond the grave may not necessarily cause revulsion or fear. Sometimes they may be positively welcomed. Apparitions are a very interesting category of apparition. They occur in all cultures of the world. Typically, these are uh, ghosts of the dead who come to take away the living in their final moments. Deathbed visitors may be parents, children, spouses, or lovers, someone the dying person recognizes with joy. appear to the dying up to two weeks before death if someone is, is uh, having a, a lingering illness or in the final hours. They provide a great source of relief to the dying. When they appear, the dying one is uh, able to have peace, especially if they've been in great pain or torment. Takeaway apparitions are usually not visible to other living persons, but the dying may say, uh, oh, so-and-so is here to come to take me away, and nothing is apparent to anyone else in the room. Frequently, the dying person sees scenes of great beauty, what will be the heaven to come, literally. Beautiful gardens, majestic alpine meadows, uh, heavenly palaces, that sort of thing. The takeaway apparitions who beckon from the other side are usually loved ones who are dead, and they uh, come to take the soul away to heaven. In fact, it's a misconception to think that people are afraid of ghosts. More likely, you are to feel reassured, and in fact, sometimes encouraged to know that your loved one is on the other side and happy and well and everything is fine. Ghosts are not only there to help in the transition from life to death, they are also said to serve as guides to the afterlife. They smooth the way of the departed by helping to orient them in the world of the dead. As with deathbed visitors, most ghostly guides are presumed to be family members, and the reunions on the other side are said to be joyous. This kind of spontaneous comfort bringing or information carrying ghost is one kind, but there are also, of course, the haunting ghosts, those who are associated with a particular place where they just seem unable to leave and is continually or repeatedly seen at that place. They haunt the battlements of a castle, they walk through the corridors of a palace or an abbey or something of the sort. And usually they seem to be involved in their own problem. If somebody goes up to them, they probably don't respond. They just carry on walking along with a rather sad expression on their face, obviously concerned with their own personal predicament. Since the 16th century, Clononi Castle in Ireland has been haunted by the tall, gaunt spectre of a nobleman who regularly floats in and out of the castle walls. The only clues to his identity lie in a simply marked grave just beyond the castle boundary. Buried together are the bodies of Mary and Elizabeth Boleyn, cousins of Henry VIII's unfortunate wife, Anne. No one knows how they died or why they were buried together, but it's thought that the restless nobleman may have played a part in their mysterious demise. <laughs> ghosts are rich with dramatic potential and can be found gliding eerily through our literature. William Shakespeare, the greatest playwright in the English language, introduces ghosts liberally into many of his works, especially the history plays such as Richard III and Julius Caesar. In his tragedies, the hauntings are crucial. The ghost of Hamlet's father is the trigger for disaster, while in Macbeth, it is the ghost of the murdered Banquo who remorselessly drives Macbeth into insanity. Royalty is well represented among British ghosts, and several kings and queens seem unable to rest in their graves. Most commonly seen is the ghost of the tragic Anne Boleyn, wife of Henry VIII and mother of the first Queen Elizabeth. Anne's inability to produce a male heir brought a sudden end to her reign. 
and her life. To enable Henry to move on to his next wife, the young and beautiful Anne was imprisoned in the infamous Tower of London. Trumped up charges of adultery, witchcraft and treason were brought against her. And in the year 1536, Anne was beheaded. Since then, her ghost has been seen in five of the places where she lived, including the last, the Tower of London. There, the beef eaters, traditional guardians of the tower, have seen her in several guises. Sometimes Anne appears simply as a glowing light. More often, her spectral figure is seen walking through the precincts of the castle. But most spectacular of all are those occasions when she materializes as a gliding figure carrying her head under her arm. This unsettling sight is one of the most famous haunting images. The ghost of Anne Boleyn is also seen at several other locations. She is said to haunt her childhood home at Blickling Hall, as well as her favorite royal palace at Hampton Court. At these places, her ghost seems more at ease. Rarely is she seen in her headless form. Instead, her ghost walks quietly through gardens and courtyards, revisiting the scenes of her happiest moments for their resident ghosts. The White House in America is such a place. It's interesting that Abraham Lincoln, who later became a most active ghost, was himself fascinated by spiritualism. In an effort to communicate with his dead son, he sought the help of several mediums. We do not know whether he ever contacted his son, but the messages received during the long seances are credited with among other things, convincing him of the evils of slavery. Mediums became popular with the advent of spiritualism, which began in the late 1840s and it swept across America and went across the Atlantic to England. They became very popular during, especially during the Civil War in America, when there were so many bereaved people desperate to receive reassurance that their loved ones were all right in the afterworld. Seances became the height of fashion in home entertainment, and the most popular mediums were heavily booked. People who had barely known that a spirit world existed were now experiencing contact with the dead nightly. A seance is a gathering that is an attempt to communicate with the dead. Uh, people gather around a table with a medium. It's uh, usually held in a darkened place. They may hold hands around the table. And when the medium is in a proper altered state of consciousness, phenomena begin to happen. This may include uh, levitation or table tilting, movement of objects, appearance of strange objects, supports, and messages from the dead. Sometimes materializations occur at seances. These would be the alleged appearance of a ghost itself. A medium could get a direct message from a spirit and speak it or go into a trance and have his or her body used as a vehicle for a spirit to speak. There was quite a bit of trickery associated with mediumship in the 19th century and even into the 20th century, but yet there are many cases of interesting phenomena that occurred that can't be explained. Seances were unpredictable and that quality attracted many. Once contact with the other side was established, anything could happen. Freshly gathered exotic flowers with the dew still upon them could appear from nowhere. Musical instruments and the favorite possessions of the departed might also appear. Lincoln himself saw a piano rise unaided into the air. Perhaps it was his sensitivity to spiritual matters that led Lincoln to have two marked premonitions of his own death. Before his election in 1860, he had been alarmed by seeing a second detached image of himself in his mirror. Just 10 days before his assassination in 1865, he had a powerful dream which was to come true. He wrote in his journal, I retired late. I soon began to dream. 
There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. Then I heard subdued sobs as if a number of people were weeping. I thought I left my bed and wandered downstairs. There the silence was broken by the same pitiful sobbing, but the mourners were invisible. I went from room to room. No living person was in sight, but the same mournful sounds of distress met me as I passed along. Determined to find the cause of a state of things so mysterious and so shocking, I kept on until I arrived at the East Room, which I entered. Before me was a cattle fact, on which rested a corpse wrapped in funeral vestments. Around it were stationed soldiers who were acting as guards, and there was a throng of people, some gazing mournfully upon the corpse, whose face was covered, others weeping pitifully. Who is dead in the White House, I demanded of one of the soldiers. The president was his answer. He was killed by an assassin. Then came a loud burst of grief from the crowd, which awoke me from my dream. I slept no more that night, and although it was only a dream, I have been strangely annoyed by it ever since. Lincoln's murdered body was taken to his home in Springfield, Illinois, where he was buried. Even the funeral train that carried his body became supernaturally charged. It's said that each year at midnight on the anniversary of his assassination, a phantom funeral train retraces its journey across America. along the route stop as it passes. The train makes no noise and never arrives at its destination. Several visitors to the White House have reportedly seen the recurrent ghost of the assassinated president. First Lady Grace Coolidge, President Harry Truman, even British Prime Minister Winston Churchill received a visit from the ghost when he stayed at the White House. Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands gave a clear account of her ghostly encounter with Lincoln. One night during a visit to President Roosevelt, she was in her room reading her Bible. She answered a knock at her door and was confronted by a tall bearded man in a top hat and 19th century clothes. She only realized the next morning that it was the ghost of Lincoln that she had seen. After his death, his widow, Mary Todd Lincoln, went under an assumed name to the spirit photographer, William Mumler. The resulting photograph shows a misty image of the dead president next to his wife. Bostonian William Mumler was at the forefront of a new vogue. In 1861, he had developed a photographic plate which seemed to contain a ghostly image. The idea was born, and soon spirit photographers were being produced to order. Almost as soon as the camera was invented, it was being exploited in all kinds of ways. And one of the most dramatic was to photograph spirits of the dead. This was the kind of proof that people were looking for, and at last it seemed that, thanks to the camera, they were going to obtain it. And the result was you got a great number of people producing trick photographs in which ghostly spirits were shown. Roughly what happened was that the sitter would sit down in front of a camera and the photographer would uh, take a picture. Apparently there would be nobody else in the room, but when the picture was developed, lo and behold, there would be a sort of amorphous shape in the corner of the picture on which a face could be discerned. The fact that the same face turns up over and over again in lots of different pictures and was identified by lots of different people as their relative, not anybody else's, is beside the point. It convinced a great number of people. Even when the famous uh, French photographer Bouguet was exposed as a cheat, a great number of people went on believing that they had really received evidence of their, the survival of their relatives due to this uh, photographic process. Very few of the spontaneous photographs of ghosts are convincing. One of the rare exceptions is the Greenwich ghost. Here we have a picture which was taken in a known place by a known person on a known date, and it shows, apparently, a ghostly figure on a staircase where no figure was actually seen. 
The camera was not the only kind of device to be used to try to establish the existence of ghosts on a scientific basis. But the best known, of course, is the planchette, which is a simple device where you rest your hand on a small platform of wood on which a pencil is fixed, and the pencil apparently uh, writes messages, and these are allegedly dictated by the spirits of the dead. So this is a form of communication which is supposedly independent of any human contact. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, a series of machines and devices were invented to try to make direct contact with the spirits. No matter how simple or elaborate, they all were intended to bypass the need for a medium. None of them improved on the Ouija board. The Ouija board, which is how most people speak of it, is in fact derived from the two words oui, which is yes in French, and ja, which is yes in German. Once again, the idea was that we would put questions to the spirits and they would answer. And so uh, an arrow or something would be directed in the, in the direction of a particular letter or a particular numeral or simply the answers yes or no to the questions that were posed. Many skeptics would say there's no such thing as a ghost. And in a strictly scientific sense, you'd have to say there is no proof. No definite, absolute, certain, 100% proof. What we have is testimony. We have more than 2,000 years of stories of ghosts. Are we really going to say that every single one of the people who tell us these stories was imagining it? More ghostly occurrences attached to Clohan Castle than to almost any other site in Europe. Located in Banagher, Ireland, Clohan has been inhabited for more than a 1,000 years. During its history, it has been the scene of much bloodshed. Norman invaders were driven out in 1336 by Owen O'Madden, the great Irish chief who settled there with his clan. Two centuries later, the O'Maddens again defended their land. This time, it was against English invaders. In 1595, they were attacked by the Elizabethan English army. And there was a terrible battle here, and 200 people were killed in one day. Started at the top, came down the spiral staircase, locking the doors as I went. And I banged a lock like that, and at that moment a silvery shape shimmered in the corner. And at the split second the door shut, the most unearthly scream went up. High-pitched screaming. And this went on for about a minute. And then complete silence. You see, I was standing where 46 people were executed, thrown off the top in 1595. I was actually standing on some of their graves. Sometimes the ghosts of Clohan did more than scream. We had the strange experience of my caretaker saying that we're having a very odd thing happening. We've got a cushion in the dining room, which is being moved every Wednesday and Sunday night. And it's always moved in the same way, from the right. Uh, he went round taking photographs, and he took one of the cushion and the, the settle where the cushion was, and um, thought nothing more of it. So when the, the, the picture came out, there was this figure kneeling in front of the settle with his right hand on the corner of the cushion that was always moved. I believe that traumatic experiences imprint something on the walls in a form of energy and if someone is sensitive enough or the circumstances are right that that can bring it back. But beyond that I believe that when people die they continue to exist on another level and in certain circumstances and in certain places they are able to appear to us and I believe that this is one of those places. 
People are definitely do not die. They can return if they wish to return. I, I don't think that when I die that I will be gone completely. I think that uh, if someone starts mucking around in this place and I'm in some other form, I'll do my best to remind them of the fact that they shouldn't be doing it. Who knows?